All right, good morning. Um, let me just start with a couple of announcements. So this week we will have recitations, okay? So I think for your section it's going to be on Thursday morning. So, uh, you know, the teaching assistants actually sent you an email which includes homework assignments. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the semester, we're not going to collect the homework, so you, you do not need to turn in the homeworks, but it's a good idea for you to work on those problems because it's going to be uh, useful for the, the quiz. And there's going to be a quiz on Thursday, so I think it's going to be at 5.40 on Thursday. Um, and we're going to send you the locations, the exact locations, okay? So it's going to be in the uh, engineering building. Uh, the, the exact rooms will be sent to you by email. Um, any questions? Sorry? So it's on the syllabus actually, it's going to be at 5.40 on Thursday. Uh, I don't know yet, so, okay? Um, all right, so today we're going to continue sort of, uh, you know, looking at problems. And uh, so last time, uh, last week we started looking at, you know, integer program formulations and then we talked about binary variables. And we said that, you know, binary variables actually give us great flexibility in terms of uh, modeling yes-no type of decisions. So today we're going to continue our discussion. So this is a problem about, uh, about fixed costs. Okay? Um, I suppose that we have the following problem. So we have a set of warehouses labeled 1 through M. So we have M warehouses. M is, of course, given to us. And we have a set of clients. Again, we label them 1 through N. So there are M warehouses and N clients that we uh, need to serve. So we can denote by DJ the total demand of client J. So client basically means like, like a customer. So each client has a certain demand. The first client has demand of D1, the second one is demand of D2, and so on and so forth. And these are again known to us, so these are parameters of the problem. <coughs> so AI denotes the capacity Um, of warehouse I and I goes from 1 to M. So each warehouse has a certain capacity. So in particular, the first one is a capacity of A1, the second one is a capacity of A2, and so on and so forth. Um, and then we have Cij. So this is the unit cost of transportation. transportation from warehouse I to client J. So here I goes from 1 to M and J goes from 1 to N. Now we have this additional constraint. So if warehouse I is used to meet the demand, then there's a fixed cost. There's a sort of one-time fixed cost of, we can call it Fi. So I goes from 1 to N. And what we want to do is the following. So we want to meet the total demand of each client its minimum total cost. So let me just go over the problem again. So suppose that we have M warehouses. So here's a picture that you can think of. So there's a total of M warehouses. So this is the first one, the second one, and so on and so forth, all the way up to M. And then we have N clients. So this is the first client, the second one, all the way up to N. 
and each warehouse has a certain capacity and each client has a certain demand. Okay, so what we want to do is we want to, you know, send or meet the demand of each client from warehouses. So for example, maybe from warehouse one, I can send some shipment to client one, some to client two, and maybe some to client n as well. Um, maybe, you know, warehouse two will not be used at all, and maybe warehouse n will only satisfy demand of client two, and so on and so forth. Okay? So this type of problem should look familiar to you because we actually looked at a problem earlier. So what kind of problem does this problem look like? So remember we had a special name, so we had supply points and we had demand points, so transportation, transportation problem, exactly. So this is, this is like a transportation problem, but there's one difference. And the difference is the following. So if you look at this condition right here, I mean up to this point everything is pretty much the same, okay? So, you know, each uh, warehouse has a certain capacity, each client has a certain demand, there's a unit cost of transportation from, from each warehouse to each client. However, there's this additional constraint or additional condition that says that if I use warehouse I, okay, so which means that if I send anything from warehouse I, then there's a fixed cost that I need to pay as well, okay? So, for example, in this case, in this particular example, I'm going to send some shipment from warehouse one, so as a result, there's a sort of certain fixed cost that I have to pay as well, okay? But I pay this fixed cost only if I use that warehouse, okay? If I don't use that warehouse at all, then, then I don't pay anything at all. So think of this as a, as a one-time cost. If I use warehouse I, then, then I'm going to pay that cost. And if I don't use it, then I'm not going to pay anything. So think, you can think of this in the following way. So for example, if I use warehouse one, then I need to send a truck, for instance, okay? So there's a cost of that truck. So that, uh, that cost is included maybe in this fixed cost part. Okay, so the, uh, one thing that you should pay attention to is the following. So this is independent of the amount that you send from warehouse I. Okay, so even if you send one unit from warehouse I, you still need to pay that, that, that amount, the same amount. Okay, so it's independent of, of how much you send. It's a function of whether you use that warehouse or not. Is that clear? Okay, so the question is basically how can we sort of model this problem? Uh, and my fir first question would be the following. So. So what kind of a decision, or what type of decisions are we facing in this problem? So what can we control in this problem? Excellent. So there are basically two decisions that we need to make. Okay. So the first one is that, for example, for a given warehouse, am I going to use it or not? Okay. Why do I need that decision? Because based on that, I'm going to uh, figure out whether I'm going to pay this cost or not, okay? So there's a first decision. So first of all, among these M warehouses, which ones am I going to use, okay? And secondly, among the ones that I'm going to use, how much am I going to send from each one to each client, right? So there are basically two decisions I need to make. So once again, the first one is that for each warehouse, whether or not I'm going to use that warehouse, okay? And the second one is that if I use a warehouse, then how much am I going to send from that warehouse to each of the clients, okay? So if you compare this with the transportation problem, of course, in the transportation problem, we didn't really need to worry about whether we're going to use the warehouse or not because there was no fixed cost, okay? However, now we have to also decide, you know, whether a particular warehouse will be used or not, okay? All right, so let's figure out our decision variables then. So once again, if you think about the first decision that we need to make, so a given warehouse, are we going to use it or not? Okay? So what kind of a decision is that? Well, it's a yes-no decision, okay? Which can be modeled using a binary variable, okay? So how should I define my variable? Well, I'm going to define, let's say, yi, and I'm going to set it equal to 1 if warehouse i is used, and I'm going to set it equal to 0 otherwise. And since I have m warehouses, I'm going to have m such binary variables. Okay? All right, what else do I need? What was the second decision that we need to make? So from each warehouse, how much am I going to ship to each client? So how can I define it as a variable? So I'm going to need a variable for each pair of warehouse and clients, basically, right? So how can I define it? I can use xij, for instance. So this is the number of units 
shipped from from warehouse I to client J. So what are the possible values of I? So I actually represents the warehouses, so I will take the value from 1 to n. And what about J? 1 to n, right? So J represents the client, so J goes from 1 to n. So there is a total of m times n decision variables, right? For xijs and m additional variables for yis. OK? So once again, please keep in mind that everything on the sort of left side of the board is, is given to us, OK? So these are parameters. So we know, for example, ais and djs and cijs. So these are not variables. So these are known to us. Uh, so the only things we need to decide are basically the values of yi and the values of xij. OK? All right, so let's construct our model then. Let's start with the objective function. What's my objective function? What's my goal in this problem? So I want to minimize total cost, right? OK, so what are the sources of cost? There's a cost of transportation. That's good. What else? And there's a fixed cost, right? So, OK, so how can I write it in terms of my decision variable? So it's going to be a minimization problem. So let me start with the transportation cost. So what's the transportation cost in terms of my decision variables? Cij times xij, exactly. So xij is the number of units shipped from, from warehouse I, I to client J, and cij is the unit cost of the transportation. So this multiplication will give me the cost of, cost of transportation from warehouse I to client J. Okay? And if I sum this over all clients and all warehouses, so I from 1 to m and J from 1 to n, this will give me the total cost of transportation. So once again, please keep in mind that CIJs are just parameters. So CIJ times XIJ is a valid objective function. Okay. What else? Well, there's also the fixed cost that I need to take care of. So I'm going to multiply FI times YI. So what does that mean? If yi is equal to 1, then I'm using the warehouse i, so which means that I have to pay a cost of fi. And if yi is 0, then I'm not using that warehouse, so I'm not paying anything at all, right, in terms of fixed cost. And I'm going to sum this over each of my uh, warehouses, right? OK? All right, so what are my constraints? So the objective function then is at, uh, sort of the total cost, which is given in terms of the total transportation cost plus total fixed cost, basically, right? All right, so what are my constraints? Sorry? Exactly. So we have a bunch of constraints, basically. So first of all, we can think of the capacity of the warehouse, OK? So we know that from each warehouse, we cannot ship more than AI, OK, AI units. So how can I write this as a constraint? So I'm going to look at xij. Um, well, let's, let's first figure out the sort of capacity constraint, OK? So for example, I'm going to look at warehouse i, OK? And from warehouse i, I'm going to look at all the shipments, OK? And I want to make sure that that sum cannot be more than the capacity of the warehouse, right? So how can I write this as a constraint? So I'm going to sum this over what? I'm going to sum this over j, right? I'm going to keep the first one fixed. So j goes from 1 to n. So what is this expression? This is the total amount of shipment from warehouse i, basically, right? OK. And what's my constraint? So this cannot be more than ai. So total amount of shipment from warehouse i cannot exceed the capacity of warehouse i. OK. And I will have this constraint for each of my warehouses. So I will go from 1 to n. OK. What else do I have? I also have to meet the demand of each client. So how can I write this as a constraint? 
so now I'm going to fix the second index, right? The second index corresponds to the client. And I'm going to sum over the first indices, right? So if I sum over the first indices, that's going to give me the total amount of shipment to client J, right? Okay, so I'm going to sum this over I. I goes from 1 to N. And what's the right-hand side? Exactly. So the demand should be met, so this is going to be at least DJ. And I'm going to have this constraint for each of my, um, each of my clients. Okay. What else do I need? Well, XIJs are non-negative, right? And depending on what the product is, they can also be integer valued, but let's suppose that it's a divisible product, so XIJ is non-negative, so this is true for each i and j. And yi's are, are binary variables, so they can be only 0 or 1, and this is true for each of the yi's. Yes. Why you multiply this by like this? What's the problem with that? We're multiplying two variables, right? Can we do that? So remember, in an LP problem, we should only have a constant times a variable, right? So here we have a constant times a variable times a variable. So this would not be an LP problem. Okay? So in an LP problem, you can never multiply two variables. Okay, so as a result, actually this is not going to work. Okay? Now there's one problem with this formulation. And I would like you to figure out what the problem is. Note that xij denotes number of units shipped from warehouse i to client j, and yi denotes whether or not warehouse i will be opened, right? So which means that there should be a relationship between xij's and yi's, okay? However, in the formulation right now, there's no relationship at all between xij's and yi's. So xij's and yi's are not connected, actually, in this formulation. Does everyone see that? So as a result, this formulation is not quite correct as this, but, but it can be corrected. So the question is, how can we correct this formulation? So how can we tell our model that there's a relationship between xij's and yi's? So let's try to think of it in the following way. So for example, if yi is equal to 0, OK? So what does that mean? If yi is equal to 0, I'm not opening warehouse i, or I'm not using warehouse i. Well, in that case, all the xij's should also be 0, right, for that particular value of i. OK, so which means that if I'm not using that warehouse, then I cannot ship anything from that warehouse. So right now, that link is missing in this formulation. OK, so my question basically is the following. How can we fix this formulation? So one suggestion was that you know, we can multiply xij's by yi's, but we cannot do that because we can never multiply two variables. OK, that would actually solve our problem. However, unfortunately, we cannot do that, so we have to do something else. I mean, we can, but it's not going to be an LP problem or an IP problem, okay? So the question is basically, uh, how can I make sure that there's going to be a relation between XIJs and YIs in my model? So I'm going to multiply what exactly? I'm going to multiply these two? No, yi. Oh, okay. So I'm going to multiply this by yi. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so let's see if, if, if that's going to work. So the suggestion basically is the following. So instead of writing ai, why don't I write ai times yi here? Okay? And let's see if, if that's going to actually do the trick for us. So first of all, this is still an LP constraint. 
right? Because if I put everything on the left hand side, I have a constant times a variable, constant times a variable, and right hand side is another constant, which is zero. So if yi is equal to one, okay, if yi is equal to one, then that means that I can send at most a units, ai units basically, right? So the right hand side becomes ai. If yi is equal to zero, then the right hand side becomes zero, right? And if the right hand side is zero, then this sum has to be zero as well. Why is that? Because all the xij's are non-negative. Okay? Well, so what does that mean? If yi is zero, this constraint actually forces each xij to be zero as well. Okay? On the other hand, if yi is one, then that means that I can ship at most ai units. So it looks like this actually solves our problem. Um, on the other hand, there's one uh, still a problem actually with this formulation. The left hand side can be zero, right, in this constraint. And yi can still be equal to one, basically, right? So that, that is still possible, right? So this summation can be equal to zero, and yet yi can be equal to one. So which means that I'm not sending anything from warehouse i, but still I'm actually paying the price. So this constraint still allows that. Does everyone see that? So let, let me put it this way. So if yi is zero, okay, then this summation should be less than or equal to zero, but each xij is non-negative, which means that each of these terms should be equal to zero. Okay? So that means that if yi is zero, I'm not uh, opening warehouse i, or I'm not using warehouse i, which means that I cannot send anything from warehouse i, which is good. Okay? If the left-hand side is positive, so if I'm sending something from warehouse i, then it forces yi to be equal to one as well. Right? Because otherwise I cannot satisfy this constraint. Okay? So, which means that if I send something from warehouse i, then yi should definitely be equal to one. Okay? However, there's this third situation that uh, there's a problem with, which is, you know, this sum can still be equal to zero, right? And the right-hand side can still be equal to one. Well, the constraint will still be satisfied, right? So this one will be zero, and ai times one will be equal to ai, so zero is less than or equal to ai. Okay, so, so as a result, um, basically, you know, this constraint actually ensures two things, okay? So the first one is that if yi is zero, then this has to be zero, okay? And secondly, it also ensures that if this is positive, then yi should be one, okay? However, there's this third situation in which, as I said, you know, this sum can still be zero and yi can still be equal to one. So in which case, the constraint is still satisfied, okay? However, if I look at my objective function, the objective function will try to make yi zero if it can. Why is that? Because by making yi zero, I'm going to obtain a smaller cost, basically, okay? So as a result, uh, I will, in the optimal solution, I will never have a situation in which this is zero and this will be equal to one, okay? Why not? Because if I have such a solution, then by making yi equal to zero, I can decrease my objective function so I can find a better solution. Okay? So as a result, this constraint actually does the trick for us. It solves our problem. Okay? So it makes sure that, uh, you know, yi will be one if and only if we send something from, from warehouse i. Okay? And if we don't send anything at all, then yi will be zero, necessarily zero. Does everybody see that? So this is important because uh, I just want to make sure that everybody understands this. Any questions? Yes? I don't understand how the problem is solved. I mean, it can be still, uh, XIJ can be still zero, and the other one still can be That's right. So, so basically what I'm saying is the following. So in this formulation, you still have solutions, feasible solutions, in which this is zero, and this is equal to one. Okay? So that's still a feasible solution of this problem. So what I'm saying is the following. So that solution can never be optimal for this problem. Okay, why not? Because if I have such a solution, then by making yi equal to zero, okay, I can actually decrease my cost. Why can I decrease my cost? Because I'm going to also eliminate the contribution of fi to my cost. Okay? So as a result, in the optimal solution, I will never have a situation where this is zero and yi is equal to one. Okay? Yes? It's always a feasible solution, okay? The third choice is always a feasible solution, but it will never be an optimal solution, okay? So basically, just like we did in one of the earlier problems, we're using the combination of the constraint and the objective function in some sense, 
Okay? Then we have to model it differently. Then this is not going to work. Okay? So here what I'm saying is that since the objective function is also... So if you look at the objective function, the objective function is trying to make yi equal to zero if it can. Why is that? Because by making yi zero, I'm actually sort of getting rid of the contribution of the fixed cost. Okay? So I'm actually using that property here. Okay? So if, if, the, if the model can make yi equal to zero, it will try to make it zero. Okay? So as a result, it will ensure that if this is zero, then yi will necessarily be equal to zero because of the objective function again. Okay? So once again, in this formulation, there are feasible solutions in which this is zero and this is one, but such feasible solutions will never be optimal. Okay? Will never be the best solution. So despite the fact that the constraint does not quite handle the relationship exactly, I'm using the power of objective function as well. Okay? And if I combine with it, then I make sure that this is positive if and only if yi is 1, and this is 0 if and only if yi is 0. Okay? And since I only care about the optimal solution, the optimal solution will satisfy that already. Okay? Does everybody see that? Other questions? So once again, this is important, and this is another sort of, you know, uh, use of binary variables. So by simply multiplying ai by yi, we just make sure that, you know, the right-hand side either becomes ai if yi is equal to 1, or the right-hand side becomes 0, in which case we cannot ship anything from warehouse i. So as a result, um, you know, this kind of formulation really does the trick for us. Okay? Does everybody understand this? So I just want to make sure that this is clear. Okay? All right, so then I'm going to move on to another use of binary variables, example 18. So these are known as logical constraints. So suppose that we have the following problem. So let's say a manager should choose from among 10 different projects Projects labeled 1 through n, 1 through 10. So we assume that Pj is the profit from project J. And since I have 10 projects, I have 10 different profits. Um, Cj is the capital requirement of project J. And once again, J goes from 1 to 10. So I think of capital requirement as the investment, the initial investment, basically, for that project. Uh, we assume that Q is the total available budget. And our goal is to maximize total profit. So suppose that you're the manager of a company and you have 10 different sort of, you know, alternative projects basically. And each project has a certain profit. And each project has a certain capital requirement. And you have a certain uh, available budget for the projects, which we do not buy two. These are all given to you. And what you want to do is you want to actually sort of pick which projects you're going to invest. And your goal is to maximize your total profit. Okay? Now, if you think about this problem a little bit, we have seen the exact same problem earlier. Can anyone find the relationship between this problem and one of the earlier problems? Okay. Okay. But my question is the following. So I, I claim that there's a relationship between one of the earlier problems that we've seen and this problem. Well, here's one way to think about this problem. Think of Q as the 
the capacity of my suitcase, okay? Cj is the, the weight of project J in my suitcase, and Pj is the value of project, right? So what does that look like? Just an FSEC problem, right? So it's precisely the same as an FSEC problem so far, okay? So we have 10 projects, we have 10 items, and from these 10 items, we're going to pick the best ones, and we have a capacity constraint, basically. So this is just an FSEC problem, okay? So uh, it's actually stated differently, but it has the same exact formulation so far, okay? So however, we're going to assume that we have the additional, following additional requirements. So the first requirement is that projects 3 and 4 cannot be chosen together. So suppose that there's some sort of a you know, conflict of interest or something like that. If you choose 3, you cannot choose 4. And if you choose 4, you cannot choose 3. Okay? The second requirement is the following. At least 2 and at most 4 projects um, can be chosen from the set from the set 1, 2, 7, 8, 9, 10. So basically among the 6 projects 1, 2, 7, 8, 9, 10 you should pick at least 2 but you cannot pick more than 4. Okay, so that's another restriction. Um, number three is the following. Either both projects, projects one and five are chosen. Or neither one is chosen. So if you choose one, then you have to choose five as well. And if you don't choose one, then you cannot choose five either. Okay? Number four. So at least two of the projects at least two of the projects, one, two, three is chosen. Or um, at least two of the projects of the projects uh, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 are chosen. And I'm going to add that or both of them can be possible. So think of this in the following way. I have to make sure that I'm going to pick at least 2 from 1, 2, 3 or I'm going to pick at least 2 from 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 or I can do both, okay? So I have to do at least one of these two. Okay, and number five goes as follows. So if at least one of one and two are chosen, one and two is chosen, um, then at least one of nine and 10 should be chosen. Nine and ten should be chosen. All right, so now let me try to explain these sort of additional requirements. Um, so we're still looking at the same problem, okay? We're choosing projects from a sort of a pool of projects. However, uh, we cannot arbitrarily choose them, okay? So suppose that there are some additional restrictions. Um, the first one says that projects three and four cannot be chosen together. So for example, um, you know, uh, there's a certain conflict, for example, between projects three and four. So as a result, you cannot uh, pick the two together at the same time. 
Uh, number two says that there's a certain subset of projects, uh, one, two, seven, eight, nine, ten, and from the subset you have to pick at least two, and you cannot pick more than four. Um, so as a result, there's this additional constraint. Uh, three tells you that either projects one and five should be chosen together, or none of them can be chosen. So basically, there's a certain relationship between one, between one and five. Number four says that uh, from the subset one, two, three, you should pick at least two, or from the subset four, five, six, seven, eight, you should pick at least two, or you can do both of them as well. Okay, so think of these as two different requirements. So this is the first requirement, this is the second requirement, so at least one of them should be satisfied. And finally, we have an if condition, so if I pick at least one of the projects one and two, then I should pick at least one of the projects nine and ten. Okay, so there's a certain logical requirement as well. So there's a certain relationship between one and two and nine and ten. If I happen to choose at least one of them here, then I should pick at least one of them from nine and ten. Okay? And my question basically is the following. So how can I maximize my total profit by satisfying all of these additional requirements? Okay? Now we have never seen this kind of constraints before, right? So, you know, if something happens, then something else happens, or um, or I can do either this one or, or the other one, and so on and so forth. So these are known as logical constraints, okay, as the name of the example suggests. Um, they are logical constraints in the sense that, you know, uh, there are certain relationships, logical relationships. So if you do something, then you have to do something else, okay? So one way to think about this is the following. So for instance, um, suppose that you're picking classes for your uh, sort of curriculum, for your schedule. Um, for example, you cannot take Math 102 before taking Math 101, right? So there's a certain logical relation, basically, okay? Um, and similarly, for example, there may be two classes with a similar content, like Math 220 and 225, for instance. You cannot uh, sort of take them together, for instance, okay? Um, so as a result, I mean, this type of constraints actually arises in different settings, and this would be one example. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to sort of model this problem right now, okay? So let's start with defining our decision variables. All right, so what are my decision variables for this problem? Exactly. So, um, so we have a control for each project. They're going to have a yes-no decision. Are we going to pick this project or not? So we can model it using a binary variable. I'm going to call it XI, uh, sorry, XJ. XJ will be 1 if project J is chosen. And it's going to be 0 otherwise. And I'm going to define one variable for each of the projects. So I'm going to have 10 projects. So I'm going to have 10 binary variables. All right, so what's my objective function? I want to maximize my total profits. So how can I express it in terms of my decision variables? So obviously it's going to be a maximization problem. So I'm going to multiply pj by xj. So if xj is equal to 1, then I'm going to get pj, get profit. If xj is 0, then I'm going to get nothing from that project. And if I sum this over all projects, this will tell me the total profit, right? Well, so I'm talking about profit, basically, okay? So um, the capital requirement is something else. So profit is basically after the capital requirement, okay? So think of profit as net profit, basically, okay? All right, so what are my constraints? Well, I have a budget constraint, basically. So how can I express that? CJ times XJ will be the capital requirement of project J. And if I sum this over all projects, J from 1 to 10, so this will be total capital requirements, and this cannot be more than Q, which is my available budget. What else do we have? Well, XJ should be binary. Now, so far, this is the same as knapsack formulation, okay? So we are maximizing total values subject to the sort of availability constraint, and each variables are, are binary variables. So, so far, as I said, uh, this is the same as the problem 
until these additional requirements. Okay? So now let's try to figure out the, how we can formulate these additional requirements. Um, let me start with the first one. So how can we formulate the first requirement? So how can we make sure that projects 3 and 4 cannot be chosen together? Okay, so, you know, basically, one may think about the first requirement is the following. So projects 3 and 4 cannot be chosen together. What does that mean? x3 and x4 cannot be equal to 1 at the same time. Okay? So how can I express it as a constraint? Well, if I look at the sum of x3 and x4, okay? So I need to make sure that this cannot be 2. Okay? So can I do something like this? So this is different from 2. No, we cannot because it's not going to be LP constraint, basically, right? Okay, so we have to do something else. What are we going to do? Exactly. So if I put this constraint, so then this says that from 3 and 4, I can pick at most one of them. Okay? And that makes sure that the first requirement is satisfied. So this takes care of the first requirement. All right, so is that clear? So that wasn't too difficult, right? So let's move on to the second one. So I need to make sure that at least two, and, but not more than four projects will be chosen from this subset, one, two, seven, eight, nine, ten. So how can I write this as a constraint? Exactly. So basically, again, another way to think about this is the following. So if I look at my variables x1, x2, x7, x8, x9, and x10, okay, then at least two of them should be equal to one. But at, at most four of them can be equal to one at the same time. Okay? So the question is how can I write as a constraint? Well, so if I look at this summation, so this will tell me basically from this subset how many projects I'm gonna pick. Right? And if I simply say that this is gonna be less than or equal to four, so this tells me that from these six projects, I can pick at most four of them. Basically, right? Okay. Similarly, I have a lower bound. So x1 plus x2 plus x7 plus x8 plus x9 plus x10 should be at least two. So the first one tells me that from this subset, I can pick at most four. The second one tells me that from this subset, I, can, I have to pick at least two. Okay. So these together actually formulate the second requirement. Is that clear? Sure. You mean like this? So less than or equal to two? Well, remember every LP constraint should be of the form like constant times variable, constant times variable is less than or equal to something else, right? So as a result, I have to separate the constraints. Okay. Other questions? All right. Now, how about the third one? So either both projects 1 and 5 are chosen or neither one is chosen. So what does that mean? Well, if I pick project 1, then I have to pick project 5 as well. Okay? And if I don't pick project 1, then I cannot pick project 5 either. Okay? So how can I write it as a constraint? Well, so what does this actually guarantee? So if x1 is equal to 1, x5 should be equal to 1 as well. And if x1 is 0, x5 is 0 as well. Okay? So this basically tells me that the status of the first project is the same as status of the fifth project. Okay? In terms of whether they're picked or not. If one is picked, then the other one should be picked as well. And if, the, if one of them is not picked, then the other one cannot be picked either. So this basically simple constraint is enough to formulate the third requirement, right? Does everybody see this? So. So if I pick x1, if I pick 1, sorry, the first project, then x1 is equal to 1, then this forces x5 to be equal to 1 as well. Okay? So which means that if I pick 1, then I also pick 5. If I don't pick 1, then x1 is 0. This forces x5 to be 0 as well. Then 5 cannot be chosen either. Okay? So the third one is also not that hard. Now how about the fourth one?
So let me underline the first requirement. So at least two of the projects, one, two, three, is chosen. Okay, this is the first requirement. The second one is at least two of the projects, four, five, six, seven, eight, are chosen. Okay? Now, what I want to do is the following. So I want to make sure that I will either satisfy the first requirement or the second requirement. Okay? Or I can satisfy both as well. Okay? But I need to make sure that uh, if I look at these underlined requirements, at least one of them should be satisfied. Okay? So this is different from satisfying both of them at the same time. Okay? So if I write this as a constraint and this as a constraint, then I'm going to force both of them to be satisfied. Okay? However, I want to do something different. So, uh, you know, this is, this is like basically I can either take, you know, math 101, 102 sequence or, you know, 111, 112, whatever, 115 sequence. Okay? So, oh, of course, in that case, you cannot do both. But uh, in general, you can suppose that you can do both. Okay? Uh, or, for example, this is like, you know, if you take two similar courses, then at, at most one of them can count towards a certain requirement or something like that. Okay? So the question basically is the following. So how can I formulate this as a constraint? So at least two of the projects, one, two, three, is chosen. At least two of the projects, four, five, six, seven, eight, are chosen. And I need to make sure that at least one of them will be satisfied. Okay? So first of all, does everybody understand the fact that this is different from satisfying both of them at the same time? So this is a more relaxed requirement, basically, right? Okay, I'm not forcing you to satisfy both of them, but I'm saying that you, you should pick at least one of them and satisfy that. Okay? So which means that you can pick, for example, the first one to satisfy, but you can violate the second one. Or you can pick the second one to satisfy, and you can violate the first one. Or you can satisfy both of them at the same time. Yes? You can write them again separately, but after writing them separately, you can add them up, and then this adding. Okay, so let me let me start with the first requirement. So let me just So if I just look at the first requirements, how can I write it as a constraint? So at least two of the projects, one, two, three, is chosen. So how can I write this as a constraint? So x1 plus x2 plus x3 is greater than or equal to 2. So this is the first alternative, right? OK. What about the second one? At least two of the projects, four, five, six, seven, eight, are chosen. So So once again, if I add these constraints to my model, okay, then I'm going to force both of them to be satisfied. Okay? However, I don't want that. So I want to make sure that either this one will be satisfied or this one will be satisfied. Okay? So as a result, uh, I have to do something about this. And what was your suggestion again? So Okay, okay, hold on. So the suggestion is the following. So let's add them up. So this is your suggestion, right? Well, there's a problem with this one. Okay, and the problem is the following. So for example, um, for example, you know, I can pick 1 and 2, okay? So if I pick 1 and 2, x1 and x2 will be 1. So this will be 0. Then I, do, I don't need to pick anything from here, basically, right? In that case, okay? So which means that if I look at the solution x1 equals 1, x2 equals 1, and everything else is 0, then this would be a valid solution for, for my requirement. But for this one, it's not going to be a valid solution, okay? So as a result, we have to do something else, okay? So does everyone see that this doesn't work? Okay, so basically, for example, I can have a situation in which only two of the variables here will be one, and everything else will be zero. Okay? Whereas this one does not allow that. Okay? So as a result, we have to do something else, and, and we're going to look at it after the break, okay?